thank you for inviting me. We first met two years ago at ETAW and realized we had some uh, theoretical interests together in um, embodied cognition. And uh, I didn't really realize that um, you have such an extraordinary writing unit here until this ETAW when uh, there were several presentations uh, Clara and uh, Bernadette's uh, I saw and it was really a very, very useful presentation and very thoroughly done. So I know there's not only a lot of teaching uh, uh, across the board, but also with writing fellows in the disciplines and conjunction with study programs at least. And uh, uh, I'm even, it's even a greater pleasure to be here. Um, let, let, me, um, let me start by giving you my main point. So I'll be very Anglo-American in my rhetoric. My main point is that learning to write and writing to learn are in a sense two sides of the same coin. A, a deep relationship there, I would argue and people in my tradition of studying writing would argue. I love this quote by the British novelist E.M. Forster. How can I know what I mean until I see what I say? I think we've all had that feeling, uh, consciously or not. And I have an ambitious uh, 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 agenda here, and if we don't get through it all, that's okay. First of all, uh, first of four questions, what evidence is there that writing improves learning? Secondly, how does writing improve learning? And here I'll be giving one theory of how writing improves learning, the one that's most important in North America, a genre theory drawn from a phenomenological sociology. Actually, Alfred Schutz, who went to university here in Vienna, <laughs> and uh, some evidence for it from some empirical studies. Third, how large are the differences in disciplinary writing and how quickly do good students learn those disciplinary differences or learn to operate within them? And here I'll give some findings from a natural language processing study I was a part of. And then finally, how do students learn new genres without being explicitly taught? And how can we help them so that more of them can succeed, particularly in a university uh, massified as, as it is now. And there I'll talk about a little bit about embodied cognition. Um, so does writing improve learning? This is a question that's been debated a lot. There's some ambivalent evidence. And I'll tell you, writing does not automatically improve learning. Some studies have found that writing hinders learning. But there's been some very, very good qualitative research and recently an immense study of uh, 23,000 undergraduates in 81 U.S. universities as part of the National Survey of Student Engagement. Uh, and basically what they did is take this yearly survey that's given to uh, hundreds of thousands of students on their practices. What did you do this year in your classes, some attitudes toward it, and so forth. So it's not actually measuring learning, but it's a, it's a pretty good proxy, and it's a proxy that the US educational authorities um, credit. And uh, so, some members of a team, Chris Anson, who was at um, ETA, was one of them, they added some questions about writing to this, to learn from these students, from these 23,000 students, what kinds of, of, of writing experiences they have had. And then they triangulated that, right? They uh, statistically uh, uh, got a picture of how those students that had certain writing experiences uh, 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 were like and unlike students uh, who had um, other experiences. So what they concluded is when institutions provided students with extensive, intellectually challenging writing activities, 
the students engaged in more deep learning activities, such as analysis, synthesis, integration of ideas from various sources, and grappled more with course ideas both in and out of the classroom. Secondly, in turn, students whose faculty assigned projects with these same characteristics reported greater personal, social, practical, and uh, academic learning and development. It was a highly positive study and a summary of it, um, I know I don't like to read uh, uh, a foreign language uh, uh, and if I do I want it short. This is a very short uh, um, summary of that written for university chancellors and deans and so forth to give them an idea of the results of this study. Now this is not final in any way. There's still a lot of questions about how, uh, how writing affects learning, what kinds of writing are conducive to learning. But I want to move on quickly to the second question I have. How does writing improve learning? One theory among several is the theory of genre as social action. Um, this view views genre as more than classifications of text by features, by form, but also text by function. And this depends on University of Vienna's own, Alfred Schutz, and uh, his take on Max Weber's notion of ideal types, which uh, Schutz developed into the concept of, of typification. Um, that is, we human beings, and many higher animals, um, uh, perceive the world in terms of, of functional categories. And um, a genre in this sense is a typified response to a recurring situation. Let me give you an example. If you want to get um, through a dark forest, okay, you can hack your way through it, um, but then once someone has hacked their way through it, then other people follow that path, don't they? <laughs> um, once they find something that works, they tend to keep using it. It's adaptive coping, right? And uh, um, genres are expected ways of using words and other semiotic means to get things done in certain recurring situations. Many people need to get a, through that dark forest, somebody cut a first path and others follow. Um, so written genres embody and enact the practices of a, of a field, of a discipline, of an institution. Written genres also embody and enact the values of a field or a discipline. So this concept of genre is a deep one. And then let me give you an example of a, uh, an intervention study that was done, which was the, the first study to really show uh, the effects of teaching a genre on learning. And this is very, very different than the usual kinds of genre teaching. So listen. This is a, an online resource for helping undergraduate students write laboratory reports in sciences and engineering, specifically it was chemistry. And you'll notice, although it's called lab write, it doesn't begin with writing. It begins before the students go even into the lab, right? What questions do we have? How are you gonna formulate questions or problems? What are the methods that you're gonna see in there? apparatus and so forth, then in the lab, actually doing the lab, and then we get to post-lab, that's where the writing goes on. Notice, we tend to get students in the post-whatever <laughs> world, um, but a lot of the, uh, well, let's see, uh, and this is, this is a really, and then you the lab check, so then you have the, um, uh, feedback and so forth. But notice, here's a self-guide in the post-lab. 
And notice, this is how the students do it. First they start with the methods, then the results, that makes sense, in the lab. Then they write their introduction. They figure out what those results mean and how they want to frame it. Then, once they've discovered what they mean, or decided what they mean, then they can discuss what they mean and conclude it. And only then are they ready to write the abstract. And only then, really, are they ready to write the title once they've boiled it down. And that's kind of interesting. And so if you notice down here in the actual lab report, uh, the first step is really the third step in the lab report and so forth. So the idea that you write something from the beginning to the end, no. And actually a crucial point I haven't uh, mentioned here is that the results are in graphic form. First they reduce the data to some uh, graphic representation. A uh, crucial part of the writing. So here's the study that uh, Carter, Fursley, and Weeb did. It was a controlled comparison study of uh, teaching genre as social action L1 adults, as I mentioned, lab right, with this just-in-time online help for the university chemistry students. By the way, you can see this online. You can use it, your students can use it. Um, um, they did a pre-post test on students' knowledge of concepts, knowledge of scientific method, and attitudes toward labor laboratory reports. And on all three measures, uh, the, people, the students who did lab write were better than those who had only classroom, oral, and printed instructions. So it's an interesting thing, though. Notice these researchers didn't ask, were the students writing better? They were not asking, were the students writing better? They were asking, were they learning the concepts? Were they learning the um, uh, scientific methods? And what was their attitude toward it? Um, there have been a, a series of, of other studies. Uh, one of them that Bazerman did, a longitudinal study of a whole curriculum, teacher education students, who uh, used several genres as they went through their uh, program. And it's quite an interesting study um, as well of the effects of teaching genre as disciplinary action, um, not as uh, ways with words, or not only as ways with words. Okay, let me move to the third of my fourth. Um, now, back as Brie mentioned, attitudes. Um, how large are the differences in disciplinary writing and how quickly do good students learn to write in those different ways? Uh, most students most of the time are learning new genres by writing without teachers, in the words of a famous uh, uh, book by the U.S. Uh, writing uh, scholar Peter Elbow. And they're succeeding well enough. You may have heard people say, well, you know, I learned without being taught. Uh, uh, probably you, like, like me. I didn't have much writing instruction in my, in my field. Wish I had. Um, so the, I, I'm, I'm, I'm telling you this because I want you to understand why this is important. Um, if all academic writing is pretty much the same, or the differences are sm so small that they can be ignored, then, and I think this is a mistaken assumption, but, but this flows logically, writing is transversal, it's a single or generalized, generalizable skill or set of skills that are learned once and for all, uh, once and for all genres, usually at an early age. If you can write one genre, you can pretty much write them all. You can quickly, quickly adapt. Um, and if students do not learn to write, then they are deficient, something wrong with them. Or another, in my view, mistaken assumption, uh, writing is a gift, it's what one's born with, some have it, some don't, and we can pretty much ignore the ones who don't. Uh, this was the attitude before massification of, of education, and still is the attitude of many, many um, uh, teachers. Or, third, 
one or two courses in general writing skills is sufficient or should be sufficient for students to learn to write um, in any discipline. Um, ergo, teachers in the disciplines are not responsible for improving their students' writing. It's somebody else's responsibility. Okay. But if disciplinary differences are great, then students have to learn to write in these new ways in each new discipline, and teachers in the disciplines may bear responsibility for teaching them to write in those ways or seeing to it that others do. And disciplinary writing then becomes a responsibility of all disciplines, all study programs. So this is a live question. How, how large are disciplinary differences in student writing? And there are lots of ways to, to get at this question. I was honored to be in, invited to join a, a, a natural language processing team. Um, Scott Crossley's the lead uh, with Chris Kyle and Uta Romer, who uh, kindly agreed to let me uh, present from this work. Um, it will be published uh, this year in the Journal of Writing Analytics. It used the uh, Michigan Corpus of Upper Level, level Student Papers, or MyCusp. Um, this is a, a sample of the MyCusp papers, 829 excellent papers. They're rated A by the, by the professors, or the professor who, who uh, collected the paper. 2.6 million words. They're from advanced level students. So it's a fourth year undergraduate in the US system. We have four undergraduate years and then first, second, and um, third year postgraduate. From a range of genres within these disciplines uh, in two broad areas, natural science and engineering, and two related disciplines within each of these broad areas, biology and physics in the natural sciences, and industrial and chemical engineering. So Scott uh, has developed two natural language processing tools for analysis. Uh, Tallies, which is, uh, uh, aggregates 130 indices of lexical sophistication. For example, lexical frequency, range, engram frequency, academic vocabulary, lists that have been compiled, uh, psycholinguistic word properties, and on and on and on, 130 of them. And uh, TACO, uh, which is 150 indices of cohesion, sentence and paragraph level, type token ratio, sentence overlap, et cetera. Um, the, the point here is to go beyond uh, the usual um, corpus analysis of a, a, a few features, relatively few features, or even beyond uh, Doug Biber's um, um, dimensional analysis, and to tr try to get a very, very large um, fingerprint, if you will, linguistic fingerprint of, of these. So then the statistical analysis is that the computer doesn't know what fields these student papers are from. Uh, the, uh, Scott and his team asked the computer, using this analytic tool, to simply divide them into two groups. What, which of these is most like the other? And um, then Scott and his team went back and took those two groups and then asked the computer to divide those two with me. And um, what they found is that the computer was able to discriminate, the, the software tool, was able to discriminate between fields and closely related disciplines. So, uh, 93.2 percent of the of the papers the computer classed in either uh, um, um, sciences or engineering right without knowing that the papers were and it was only slightly less um, 
able to discriminate between uh, the disciplines within biology and physics papers and industrial and chemical engineering papers. So uh, here's one of the 270 plus indices, just to give you a little language up here. Here's an example from a biology paper. It uses three connectives in five lines. And uh, physics use connectives much, much less. This is an example, no, no connectives. Um, but the point is not a specific one. It's the, it's the point that you can uh, create a fingerprint, if you will, of, 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 of these and discriminate. Uh, a, a second result was equally, uh, to me, surprising that the accuracy of discrimination was about the same for the fourth year undergraduates as it was for the second and, uh, uh, first, second, and third year graduate students. Uh, hovered around 10% uh, difference. Now, that means that the grade level was not a confounding variable in the classification accuracy, uh, but it also suggests that students, even in their last year of undergraduate, are uh, uh, a, a able to create texts that, are, uh, that, that bear this, this disciplinary fingerprint, okay, um, in the major. Now, how do they do that? Usually without explicit instruction, certainly not instruction on uh, 270 <laughs> features. Okay, how do they do that? How do they pick that up? How do students learn new genres without being explicitly taught? And how, more importantly, how can we as teachers in the disciplines help more of them acquire these specialized skills? In other words, how does what we might call an analogy with uninstructed second language acquisition, how does uninstructed genre acquisition in academic writing work? How can we theorize that? Well, the... Um, the common genre teaching approaches quite naturally focus on explicit instruction. Um, so they emphasize students explicitly and consciously learning or researching discourse features. What do papers in these fields look like? What are the, what are the moves or steps or the uh, topoi or the rhetorical strategies that are used? And there are lots of ways of, of thinking about this. Uh, in North America, we have uh, the genre knowledge of Burke and Cotter and Hucken. We have the genre moves of uh, Swales, uh, Cars, Model, EAP. We have uh, genre resources for making meaning with systemic functional linguistic, uh, Jim Martin, uh, SFL. We have the genre awareness uh, in rhetorical genre studies, Bawarshi and um, Amy Devitt and his group. What I want to suggest is that we might take a step back from written academic genres, textual genres, and ask about genres of participation. Remember that, those lab reports? We had the pre-lab, the lab, post-lab, and then lab check, um, and suggest that the genres of participation in different spheres or disciplines of human activity cross modes, media, knowledges, subjectivities, and even bodies. And uh, <clears throat> here uh, is where I turn to embodied uh, cognition. Uh, and embodied cognition is a, a, a different way of thinking about cognition how many of you are sort of familiar with embodied cognition? Okay, about, about half, okay. So um, the, the idea is that the mind is not a, uh, conceived of as a computer. The brain is not conceived of as a computer. The brain is conceived of as a bodily organ that regulates the body. Um, and it's really hard because we're so used to thinking of, of brains and nervous system in computational terms as a 
But this cognition is a for he's embodied, embedded, extended, and inactive. And I'm going to try to break those down a little bit. But before I want to stop, here's some uh, uh, agricultural engineering students in my university from a study we did a few years ago. And they're tearing apart an engine uh, you, and measuring parts to collect data, which will eventually be a, a written report. My question is, are these students learning to write academic genres here? What do you think? They're breaking this engine down and measuring parts. Are they learning to write academic genres here? All of those who say yes, hands up. All of you, uh, you know, I gave the game away, didn't I? You're not, you're not just trying to please me, are you? <laughs> okay, all, all, all who say no, I, I don't think that. So I'm trying to, you know, make this point. And, and look here, what are they doing here? They're not writing, but they're doing data entry. Because the data entry will then produce um, 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 visual representations of the data, which is what they will actually write about. That will be the real object. And this is sort of um, Science Studies 101, but... Um, how to think about this. Um, Carolyn Miller, uh, who came up with the idea of uh, genre as social action, she's a North American writing researcher and rhetoric researcher, was drawing on Alfred Schutz's uh, uh, concept of typification, um, that is to say genres. Um, but I want to think in terms of another um, uh, philosopher who also was uh, central to the phenomenological tradition, um, and that is Maurice Merleau-Ponty, the, the French uh, philosopher and, and scientist. Um, genre social action, again, came out of typification, shoots, and then Bezerman's theory of literate action is the most recent full um, um, explanation of that. But really, um, Maurice Merleau-Ponty uh, is very much behind uh, embodied cognition. Uh, it's a way back. And also, Merleau Ponty is called the philosopher of the body. Um, and you'll see why he's called the philosopher of, of the body um, in a minute. Um, neurophenomenology, drawing on Merleau Ponty, drawing on Varela Thompson and Roche and others, um, again, sees the brain as an organ, but uh, it's possible to uh, uh, triangulate first person, singular or plural, reports of one's cognitive processes, um, one's participation in the world would be a better uh, way, with uh, neurological research, fMRI or, or um, uh, uh, EEG or uh, keyboard um, uh, uh, logging or eye tracking or, or things like that um, to, to, to try to get a feel for it. Um, as information processing um, um, cognitive versus information processing cognitive psychology, which as I said earlier, views the brain as a computer and has been uh, the most important writing process theory, I can say, um, worldwide. Um, at least cognitive writing process theory. So, uh, Bree's diagrams, uh, she kindly allowed me to adapt them. <laughs> oh, yeah. So, um, uh, we might think of genre as a, as a means of typification that involves externalization and internalization between a person and the environment, person or persons, very important. Um, so in terms of internalization, people, re uh, for example, read things or see things or smell or taste or feel them or whatever. And, um, uh, uh, and then they, they externalize through writing or speaking or uh, dance or a whole range of other ways of externalizing uh, what happens. And typically they use tools to do that. With writing, we use text, we use pens, we use screens, 
for dance, we use our bodies for, you know, we externalize in, in a whole range of ways. So um, people perceive the world by typifying or categorizing experience. The people act on and thus enact the world also in, in typified ways. Um, if we didn't, we couldn't communicate. Um, there have been a lot of interesting studies on this. Um, cognition is embodied, embedded, extended, and inactive then um, in creating kind of coupling of the organism with the environment in order to achieve uh, homeostasis. So we can cope with the world, so we can survive and flourish, and reproduce, and all these other human things. Um, and, and writing is part of that for us at, in our culture at least. Uh, and genre and genre-ing perception underpin it. So what does it mean to perceive a text? Let me skip that. Let me skip that. Um, in in Merleau-Ponty's view, perception is not accomplished by applying pre-existing external rules or internal scripts. Perception is usually non-conscious. It's a matter of adaptively coping with the world as we participate in it, reinforced so it becomes habit. Um, let's, let's think a minute. When you, um, when you see, uh, let's say, a bird cross your line of vision, what happens? The, the, the image of the bird registers somehow on your retina, but you might also turn your head and follow it, or your eyes might turn and follow the, the flight of the bird. Um, perception, in this case, is active. Uh, our bodies are involved in seeing that bird. Uh, if, 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 we, um, if we see some genre, are our bodies involved with it? Is your body involved when you when you perceive a genre or you read a genre, I mean literally, your, your eyes are moving, right? Your head is moving. Often your other parts of your body. Let's break it down a little more. Let's say that it's, um, do, you get, do, you, do you fill out income tax forms in Austria? Yeah, yeah? Oh, how does your body react when you see that income tax form? <laughs> I mean, a little tension or... <laughs> yeah? <laughs> yeah. I mean, there's a... There's a, there's a um, there is a, a feeling valence, an emotional valence uh, that exists, okay? Or a beach book. Uh, Merleau Ponty has a wonderful section of um, phenomenology of perception uh, talking about um, sex. You know, uh, pornography <laughs> can have physiological reactions. I mean, it's just, uh, it, uh, our bodies are part of it. But we're typically, again, typified, we're typically not um, aware of this, of this aspect of it. But the, but the writers, in our writing, uh, writing, uh, writing coaching interactions, or we as writers, we, we are part of it. Uh, so there is um, bodily engagement. Um, and and I, I wanna notice that um, writing and reading are not natural, okay? Writing and reading do not exist in, in many cultures in the world, and they're relatively young in, in human history. 
and people have to be taught to read and write. They don't have to be taught to speak or to point or to make marks or, you see? So I guess what I'm saying is writing is built on prior functional systems. And these are three of the, of the major ones which um, uh, 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 anthropologists, uh, linguistic anthropologists, especially Hanks, have, um, have uh, uh, studied. And um, so writing processes are built on typified per perception that has grown up with pointing, marking, speaking, um, and, and, and other of these things that we, we don't have to be consciously taught. Every human being learns these as part of normal development. Right? Pointing, uh, uh, marking, and, uh, um, um, and speaking. And there's been some fascinating research on children's perception of genres. Um, Uh, before children can read or write, uh, they, 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 perceive, uh, they perceive genres. So when, in one experiment, a parent was uh, asked, pick up a newspaper and start reading it to a child. This was a four-year-old, ch four-year-old children in this experiment. And they started reading a fairy tale. Once upon a time, blah, 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 blah. and the child said, no, no, no. That's not a newspaper, <laughs> that's a storybook. So, uh, and similar ones. And when children are asked to uh, write, write like a grown up, they'll scribble, uh, often left to right even, but, but um, uh, that's. Uh, uh, so, I mean, children are, grow up in a, who grow up in a literate culture, uh, grow up learning to perceive the world with writing even before they can fully participate in that. Um, and here's this, I don't know, one-year-old kid writing. No marking, but you can see what will happen there. So these prior functional systems reconstruct consciousness and cognition, and then writing transforms further our um, consciousness and cognition. So music that is notated, written down, produces a different culture of music than music that's not written down. Okay, there are certain affordances, certain constraints, uh, religion, written down. Yeah, see how that transforms uh, functional systems. Uh, transportation, schooling is absolutely transformed through literacy. Um, so this allows us, I think, to rethink writing processes in evolutionary uh, developmental terms. And there's a very interesting um, uh, corner of cognitive psychology called evolutionary cognitive load theory, which like uh, IP cognitive tradition measures cognitive load limits on working memory and how they shape the writing processes. But evolutionary code, uh, evolutionary cognitive load theory measures the effects of cognitive load under conditions where participants can utilize functional systems prior to literacy learn from the womb to produce literacy tasks. Uh, so genres are interpersonal, intersubjective, intercorporeal, and one finding is that high cognitive load tasks are more efficiently done by distributing working memory in a group, group process, whereas low load tasks are more efficiently done individually. Why? The prior functional system of face-to-face -face communication, what we learned 
from, from childhood, early childhood, takes time and effort, but it has lower working memory costs. So group work for writing is worth the time and effort only if the task is sufficiently difficult. And you might remember that if you're using groups in your teaching. Face-to-face -face communication is a more efficient way of performing complex novel tasks because it's been already learned in practice since childhood. Uh, similarly, um, uh, imitation, imitation is a way of lowering cognitive load. Uh, children imitate from, you know what kids are like, they constantly, they're little imitators. And uh, neural pathways respond similarly to seeing someone else perform an action and performing the action oneself. Uh, some have attributed this to mirror neurons, that's very complicated, but the point is it reduces the cognitive load and makes learning and action easier. And again, research on writing has shown that uh, um, um, uh, effects of writing performance, effects of observational learning are consistently documented. People learn to write through uh, seeing others write and looking at writing. Similarly, with embodied cognition, performing motor tasks activates semiotic code, strongly suggesting that sensory motor processes are are part of processes traditionally analyzed as cognitive. So writing is done with our bodies in space and our bodies e both effect and affect our writing. Um, our writing affects our bodies. And you can see this with, with well, writing anxiety, writer's block. Um, Clinical studies of expressive writing have shown for 40 years that expressive writing about traumatic experiences for as little as 15 minutes a day, four days a week, can have a range of positive effects. It can improve lung function in asthma patients, writing can. Uh, it can raise immune system response. And we're doing, a I'm not a part of it, but, but people at Iowa State are doing a study of um, 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 hormone levels in writing tutors and, and writing, uh, 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 yeah, uh, does uh, having a, a, a successful writing uh, tutoring session um, lower the cortisol, the stress hormone? And so you do a spit test before your writing tutor and do a spit test after and <laughs> they look at your, uh, your levels. They're having trouble finding people to uh, participate in that. Um, so, uh, to, just to conclude, uh, I think it's important that we look at participation in human activities and our, our task, I think, is to be both humble and proud. What is most important to the students and their professors is not academic writing per se, it's academic participation in the important activities that are going on. It's, in the, in the professions and the disciplines and the professions beyond. We can never explicitly teach our students all the conventions and discourse genres, but we can help. And then I think we, we, we have, as you know, a role in, in raising the consciousness of professors and students. Um, and we know that, that language, writing, is increasingly successful to uh, professional participation. So, uh, I, I, I would just suggest that we you know, try to move beyond uh, uh, the word and get closer to participating in activity as we, uh, as we relate to students. You know, look at them uh, in a more holistic way. Okay, I'll stop there. Uh, and thank you for your patience in the heat. <laughs> <laughs>